Would you uh, consider yourself to be an obedient person? Like, are you the type of person when you see a sign, you're like, you're going to do what it says? Or are you the type of person where you're going to do the opposite? So I am the rule follower in our family, um, especially with, as it relates to my wife and kids. And if I see a sign that says, don't walk in the grass, I'm going to take the sidewalk the long way. And it doesn't matter how long it takes extra. I'm staying on the sidewalk. That's just my personality. Elizabeth, if, she, if you put a sign up that says, don't walk on the grass, um, she will automatically just start to veer that direction. So some of us were obedient, you know, we're, we're rule followers by nature. For others of us, we're not. And this morning, we're going to talk about obedience and really two ways to obey. So like, what is obedience? Then Paul gives us two ways to obey. If you're new here this morning, my name's Zach, and I'm a pastor here at Argo Christian Fellowship, and we're glad that you are here with us this morning. We are continuing on with our series called This Is Living, where we're going through the book of Philippians. We're walking through to see what it has in, uh, in this book for us to learn about not only God and ourselves, but how to live life well. What does God want for us as it relates to living life well in a way that is uh, fulfilling and satisfying and in a way primarily that brings God glory. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 at first, and then we'll go on a little bit further. And so let's start with uh, reading 12 and 13. If you don't have a Bible, it should be on the screen behind me says this, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is not, or for it is God, let's not add a not there, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you so much for your word and for this time to gather. We ask that you would, through your Holy Spirit, speak to us and empower us to better love you, love our neighbor, that you would draw our hearts and our minds to a greater love and understanding for you and to the life to which you have called us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so that first word there in verse 12 is therefore, and this, I know this is cheesy, but it's important. Anytime you see that in the Bible, so if you pick up your Bible and you read, whether it be a chapter or whatever, and you see therefore, it's important to know why it's therefore. So here's what therefore, yeah, cheesy, but you'll remember, it'll, it'll be, it's seared into your brain now. And so here's why that's an important word. Anytime you see therefore, it's linking the thought that's about to come with a thought that's already occurred. And so anytime you see that word, there's something that's going to be said and its foundation is what has already been said. And so it's important to understand why it's there. So last week we talked about this beautiful Christ hymn where Paul tells us why Jesus is necessary for salvation. And he tells us what Jesus did and how it's necessary for salvation. And we get this beautiful theological passage on Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully man. And Jesus was obedient to the father and he lived in our place and he died on the cross but also that his name, because of who he is and what he's done, is higher than any other name, that there will come a point in time when all people will confess, every knee will bow, and everyone will know who the true king is. And it's not Caesar, and it's not some other man, and it's not some other kingdom. It is one, Jesus and his kingdom that will stand. And so Paul is saying, here's this beautiful thing that is, therefore... Because of this, because of what we know, because of what we are, who we worship, because of what we say in our creeds, therefore, obey. Do y'all get that? Because of who Jesus is, the command is to obey. So what is obedience? Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. So obedience is literally a word Hupakuo, that's fun to say. And it's two words. It's a preposition hupa, which means over. And then it's kuo, I hear. So to obey literally means to come under something and hear and then do. And so as it relates to God's word, to obey means we come under the authority of God's message, of Jesus' message, of God's word, and then we do. We're not equal to. That's important to understand. 
We're not equal to what we claim to obey. So it's more than just a, I hear it, I like what that one says, and then I'll do it. It's a coming under. So yesterday, beautiful fall weather. I know we've got some folks in our church that love summer, and I don't understand you at all. And so we, uh, we went hiking yesterday, enjoyed the weather. We went to the little trails behind Trustville uh, ballparks, and we took Josiah, and we, we were curious how he would do. He loved every minute of it, jumping on rocks. I think mom almost had a heart attack a few times. But we got to a point where he was running pretty far ahead of us. And so I do the good dad thing. I say, Josiah, don't run too far ahead. And he turns around, and he goes, okay. I will. And then he keeps on going. You're not equal to my authority, son, to obey, to come under what I just said. I mean, I appreciate, like, this isn't a conversation, right? I appreciate that he didn't just all out ignore, ignore me, I guess. I guess. I don't really know what's better. Maybe it would have been better if he acted like he didn't hear me. Then I would have felt better about myself. But, okay, I will. And then he takes off. A lot of times we kind of do the same thing, though, as it relates to oh. Obedience, you know, God's word says, love your neighbor. And we're like, oh, I don't know if I can come under on that one. God, God, do you know my neighbor? Do you know that person that sits next to me at work? Do you know the person that I'm for? Like, ooh. No, so to obey is to literally come under and then do. We're not above or equal to God's word or God himself. And so the first thing is we're supposed to obey, Number one, obedience was important to Jesus. I mean, uh, verse eight from last week, and Jesus being found in human form, humbled himself, and he became obedient to the point of death. Obedience is a defining characteristic of a Christian, is a defining characteristic of someone that follows Jesus. It was important for Jesus, and therefore it should be important to us. So we're supposed to obey. Not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, we get to this next little phrase, work out your own salvation. Now, this is an interesting little phrase, a little difficult to understand. And if you take out the phrase right in between the you know, comma, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, take that out. It's obvious that Paul is linking, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, work out your own salvation. He's linking it to our obedience. Now, notice what this doesn't say. This doesn't say work for your own salvation. We need to understand the difference. Paul's not saying work for your own salvation. Ephesians 2, verse 8, Paul, the same writer of Philippians, says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so, understanding that it's not working for our salvation. There's an assumption that working out your own salvation, this is something that these people already have. We actually come to know this later in the verse, they're referred to as children of God. Paul is writing to people that already have salvation. They're not working for it, they're working it out. And so in the Jewish mindset, um, there's kind of three ideas of salvation I think we as modern day followers of Jesus kind of miss. There's the, the one aspect that we talk about a lot, especially in our Protestant tradition of we are justified, Ephesians 2. There's a moment that God himself, we repent of our sins, we confess Jesus is Lord, and he at that moment says you are saved, past tense. And here at Augur Christian Fellowship, we believe in eternal security, which means salvation is a gift. God gives it to us. It's his work, and he keeps us saved. And so that is this part where God says, you are saved and I'm working in you. But in the Jewish mindset, and I think something a lot of us miss, there's this kind of present mindset that Paul's talking about that you are being saved. Now we call that kind of this big word called sanctification, where because we are saved, we are now being saved, where God is working in us. We're obeying, we're conforming to the image of Jesus. We're being made more Christ-like, and it is something we're supposed to do. 
We're supposed to be obedient. We're supposed to work on loving our neighbor. We're supposed to work on loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so to work out your own salvation is this idea of sanctification. The third aspect of salvation is the future tense of we will be saved. We call that glorification. When Jesus comes back and he makes everything right. And we will one day be in the full presence of God's glory. And so this work out your own salvation is this kind of middle area. We are saved. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are saved. You have been given this gift that does not come from work so that no man may boast. But you're still working out that salvation. And the good news is because we know that that's tiresome. To be obedient is hard. It takes work and effort. So here's the good news of this. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So not only is it our effort, if you're a follower of Jesus, we understand that God himself is working in us. He has empowered us by the Holy Spirit to follow after him. He's empowered us with his Holy Spirit, with his presence to convict us when we're kind of going wayward. He's empowered us to love our neighbor when our neighbor's not very lovable. He's empowered us. It's God working in us, God himself, who does not faint and does not grow weary, who does not burn out. And so we're called to obey, but we're not called to obey in our own strength and our own power. We have God working in us. And so then we get to these very two very practical things on how to obey, Paul tells us. So we're going to read verse eight, 14 through 18. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crook, crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So two ways that we obey. We're obeying because of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done. We're obeying because it's important. We're obeying because we are working out our salvation in God's power. And I love that these really deep truths, Paul gives us two very practical ways to do this. Number one, here's what Paul says. Stop complaining. Stop complaining. The first thing, do all things. And some of us, myself included, need a circle really big, all things. Without grumbling or disputing. Isn't it funny how practical God's work can be sometimes? Obey me by not complaining. No matter what. Stop grumbling and disputing. I love this, that you may be blameless and innocent without blemished in the midst of this generation. I don't know if you know this, but negativity is pretty much the language of our culture. And here Paul is saying, and apparently this was true even in the first century. It's not a new thing. And Paul's saying, hey, to stand out in this crooked and twisted generation, this generation that seems to be doing everything else but God's ways, here's how you stand out. Stop complaining. In all things, if you're like me, that's not the easiest command. Praise God, I've got verse 13 to lean on, and it's God who works in me both to will and work for his good pleasure. I I can't do that. I'm a complainer. I am. I can, I'm sorry. I tell Elizabeth, look, I just like to see the world as it is. I I just don't like all your optimism. It's draining right? Like happy people. We've got a, uh, actually there's a, a student, she's not here this morning so I can talk about it. I wasn't planning on it. Uh, a student in our youth group and she's funny. If you are happy, she doesn't like you. She doesn't like to be around you too much. She's like, I just can't, Zach, you don't understand. I just can't stand being around people that are happy all the time. It's just annoying. Shouldn't we be like the most positive people in the world? Because if you think about it, 
as children of God, because of what we talked about last week, this beautiful Christ hymn, this inheritance that we gain that we do not deserve, this love that we have from God that we could never earn, that we as people were objects of God's perfect wrath and through his son, he transformed us into objects of God's perfect love. Even if all of our circumstances are crap, really what have we to complain about? Knowing that God himself loves us and yet we do, all of us. We fall into the temptation of speaking the language of our culture and all we do is grumble and dispute because they just don't understand what I'm going through. If they would just do it my way, if they, or this thing just happened to me. You all know that person, right? Where the world's out to get them. You're probably thinking of them right now. You're getting ready to go to Thanksgiving dinner with your family and you've, you're already deciding what chair you're not going to sit in because you don't want to listen to your family member's problems because you know that's all they're going to talk about. I mean, right? And Paul's saying, look, follow Jesus by not grumbling and not complaining. Among whom, I love this, when you do this, you shine as lights in the world. That's how, in my mind, that's how difficult it is not to speak the language of culture. Because when you do, Paul uses this beautiful, like, hey, if you live a life where you just don't complain, you're going to be a light in this world shining brightly. You shine as lights in the world. Now, how do we do this? I think verse 16 is the answer. Holding fast to the word of life. When we hold fast to the word of life, when we understand this beautiful gospel message, we can then live a life in complete contrast as far as language is concerned to the world. And we can live a life that's not filled with complaining. When we hold fast to the gospel message, when we hold fast to the word of life, when we hold fast to that truth that no matter what happens in my life, no matter what happens circumstantially to me or around me, I'm getting, as a follower of Jesus, something better than I ever deserve. What have I to complain about? We cling to, we hold fast to this beautiful message that God loves us. Understand this too. Obedience and not complaining is not contingent on the people around you. It's not. It's contingent on God loves us in spite of us. Therefore, what have I to complain about? So we're supposed to be obedient. The first way we do that in this passage is to stop complaining, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. Here we get our second thing. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice. So not only are we to stop complaining, we are to start proclaiming. It's not simply subtracting something from our speech and subtracting something from our day-to-day -day conversation. We're adding to it. Where we're proclaiming, we are rejoicing we're being glad. So not only do I cling and hold fast to the word of life, but I literally speak life around me. What would it look like in your day if instead of complaining about something or someone, you took the time to compliment that person? What would it look like? What would it look like this week if instead of grumbling about whatever it is that we're grumbling about, you just set aside time and you showed gratitude in the midst of that circumstance, in the midst of whatever situation, that what would our lives look like? We would absolutely stand in stark contrast to the world. We would absolutely shine brightly in the world. Isn't that what we're called to do? Isn't that what Jesus says? A city set on a hill this light that's shining for all to see, we're supposed to live our lives in such a way that points to and proclaims the wonder and beauty and awesome God that has given us the gospel. The awesome and wonderful God that has given us his son and empowered us with his spirit to actually love our neighbor well, 
to be a good spouse, to be a good parent, to be a good grandparent, to be a good coworker, where we're living our lives pointing to Jesus as signposts of hope in this dark and dying world. What if we stopped talking like everyone else and started talking the way Jesus wants us to? What if we quit? I mean, what would you, just, I really want you to think about that. What would your week look like? How would it be different this next week if you really thought about not complaining or disputing or grumbling? And you just, this week, you said, I'm not gonna do it regardless. I'm not gonna say anything negative about someone or situation. What if you just did that this afternoon? <laughs> I mean, you know, like, Maybe some of us can make it to the car. I don't know. I guess it depends on if you're taking your kids to the car with you. Maybe that would be helpful. I mean, seriously, though, I mean, how different would our lives look? Because if, you're really, if we're really honest, and I think one of the things Paul is telling us with this, especially as we think about shining as lights in the world, man, I just can't get over the practical implications of this is who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Therefore, stop complaining and start proclaiming. Like what would the world around us look like? I also love too that, um, I love when different studies show that God knows what he's talking about. Um, and so the uh, Mayo Clinic did a study about positive people. This is funny. I wrote these down so I didn't forget. So, scientific study. Positive people, people that don't complain all the time, have increased lifespan, lower rates of depression, lower levels of stress. I love this one. Greater resistance to the common cold. Hey, it's winter time. It's, that's why. Right. Stop complaining and start proclaiming. You won't have a cold. <laughs> Better cardiovascular health. Like all of the health benefits that come along with living life God's way just blows my mind. It's like he knows what he's talking about. It's like he's, so there's, there's like these two purposes. There's this, hey, I've got a job for you to do, right? You're not here to, as we talk about, this is living. You're not here simply to live for yourself and get, 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 and pleasure and all this kind of stuff. You're, you're here to live for a greater and more fulfilling purpose. You're here to live for my kingdom. And not only is this thing called life, I put you here for a purpose to bring me glory, but also the way I've set up for you to live life is genuinely better for your health. It's good for you to live for me in this way. I just love that. I love that. It's like they read Paul's letter or something and said, oh, well, I'm gonna do a study on positive people. We as Christians, as followers of Jesus, should never be the most negative person in the room. And far too often, we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, are some of the most negative people I know and have ever met. You know why, before I really started following Jesus, I loved to go to my local watering hole? People were happy. Now, granted, alcohol's involved. But it's just so different from the culture around me. I loved going. And people are smiling and joking. How much more so should this place have that? Instead of somebody walking in and every, anytime you walk by somebody, all you hear is somebody griping about something. Well, they didn't do this or they would have done this or my life is... I mean, seriously. I shouldn't have to go to a local watering hole to be around positive people. I mean, that, that's sad. We should be the most positive people there are because again because of who Jesus is and what Jesus did and what we get from this God who gives is unfathomable unfathom can't be fathomed <laughs> <laughs> this is our inheritance this is our identity so understand this I want to close with this thought our speech should always reflect the gospel. Our speech should always reflect 
the gospel. The gospel should permeate who we are. A few weeks ago, we talked about how the gospel should um, determine our attitude, but much more so than our attitude, it should affect also our speech. Stop complaining and start proclaiming, rejoicing in who God is and what God has given you. I mean, maybe instead of complaining about how my three-year-old doesn't do anything, I say I should take more time to thank God that I have this wonderful three-year-old. Maybe instead of complaining about whatever situation I find myself in, I take time and I just thank God for where I am, for what he's given me. And if I have nothing else to be thankful for, I've got the gospel. And thankfully, I've got a lot more to be thankful for than that. But even if I had nothing else... I have a God who loves me, who through his spirit has drawn me to himself, who's working in me for something far greater than my measly little kingdom. And so this week, the challenge is this. I want you to see how long you can go. I mean, try to go as long as you can. Again, some of you might be to the car. Some of you might make it till Thanksgiving to your, you know, around your family. I don't know. See, as long as you can go without complaining and proclaim God's goodness instead, be kind instead, show gratitude instead, compliment instead. And then, so maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your best friend. I want you to partner with somebody this morning. Okay, I'm gonna see how long I can go. You see how long you can go. And as soon as I complain, I'll text you and let you know how far I did. That's that's what I want you to do this morning. And Nate's going to come back up and we're going to sing. And I really want us to think about that fact that what have we to complain about? We're about to sing about a God who loves us. To be shining bright lights in this world, our speech should reflect the beauty of the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you. That even though, Lord, you've called us to be obedient and to work out our own salvation, you've also given us a genuine hope that you are working in us. And Lord, I pray that our speech would reflect the beauty of the gospel. That you would give us a heart and a desire to stop complaining about life and start proclaiming about the wonderful life you offer to sinners. That our speech would reflect the beauty of the gospel and would point people to you. In Jesus' holy name.